What are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm too scared to find out what you. I told do for you, me. sense of humor from Terry Pratchett. That's <laughs> uh, welcome to our filthiest episode yet, everyone. With Flux. I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratt Chat, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast. Each month, we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month, we're talking about The Dark Side of the Sun, which, if you line it up with the second lion roar in The Wizard of Oz, nothing happens. <laughs> and our guest is writer Will Kostakis. Welcome, Will. Hey, thanks for having me. Will, it's, it's always a pleasure to have a new Pratchett fan on mm-hmm. the show. Can you tell us, how did you get into reading Pratchett? Uh, So one of my closest friends in high school was really into it and he was like, in year seven, Will, you've got to start reading this, you've got to start reading this. And I remember I ran to the library and he was like, no, no, you have to only read the witches books. They're the the ones we we follow. And so I went to that one, picked up Equal Rights, started reading it. And, you know, from that first line of, you know, pay close attention, the special effects are quite impressive or expensive. And I was like, oh. Yeah, this is he's a smart ass. I like this guy. Yeah. And so I read that. I'm like, oh, that was that was okay. Like a little funny. Like there was that bit where the door hits her leg. Like that's funny. And then I went back and reread. So I did the whole series, went back and reread them when I was a little older. I'm like, oh, wow, there's a lot of rude jokes in this. And then I reread it in year 12. I'm like, wow, there's a sex joke in literally every second line. <laughs> this is, And I understand now that's where my sense of humor comes from. So, yeah. And has that influenced your own writing? Uh, no, I, so I actually met Terry Pratchett when he visited. I won one of the raffles when he spoke at the Sydney Opera House. And so I went down to meet him. My first book had just come out. And I'm like, oh, Terry, you know, you really inspired me to write. And he's like, oh, did you bring your book here? And I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, so who inspired you? Like, which character? I'm like, oh, Nanny Og. And he's like, inspired you to do what? And I'm like, oh, I write, <laughs> I write books for children. He's like, with Nanny Og. And I'm like, oh, and like just made a fool of myself. But yeah, it was, it was lovely. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, today we're not even dis- we're not discussing a witch's book. We're not even discussing a Discworld book. We've gone all the way back in time to one of his very first books. Now, I I think I'm the only one here who's read it before. Is that right? This was the first time for me. Yeah, this was the first time. And I, this is the first book we've announced, and we've had a flurry of people on on Twitter and other social media saying, "I don't know what this book is," <laughs> um, which is fair enough because it is. I remember kind of what that felt like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, yes, I'm so sorry. I'm like, Hello, <laughs> it is a Terry Pratchett book. I swear. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but it's it it is one of his very first books to be published. Not his actual very first, but it was first published in 1976. Um, so why don't we get into talking about it and we'll start as we traditionally do with a reading of the blurb. Dom Salabos had a lot of advantages. As heir to a huge fortune, he had an excellent robot servant with Man Friday sub-circuitry, a planet, the first Syrian bank as a godfather, a security chief who even ran checks on himself, and on Dom's homeworld, even death was not always fatal. Why then, in an age when prediction was a science... Was his future in doubt? Is the first Syrian banker planet like what is it? Yeah, it's a. It is. Yeah, it is a planet, but it's also a person and a robot. It's kind of like a giant, organic, naturally occurring supercomputer. I just thought it was like a big thing that was smart. <laughs> no, it's like it's it's described as a planet. So it's it's not as big. well actually it says how big it is and I I did mean to look up, you know, how big is that in comparison to other planets. But yeah, it's a planet and a person. But because it's sort of like it naturally has grown these weird silicon sort of outcroppings that make computer circuits mm-hmm. that make it into an artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz I really struggled to grasp what it was. Maybe just like I don't know. Was, well, it's a, there's a lot of ideas. Uh, there's a lot of ideas in there uh, all at once, which I think is emblematic of uh, or the book, symptomatic <laughs> of the whole book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but let's let's start at the start. All right, okay. Because we don't meet the bank straight away. Um, we start 
on a planet named, in the first of many things named, uh, things that we'll be familiar with from the Discworld, Widdershins. Apparently that's a rude word. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been blinked out by a train in the background there. <laughs> okay. um, Widdershins. I, I don't know if I've said this on, on the podcast before. Maybe I have. But when I was in high school and I was doing English, I impressed my English teacher very much because Widdershins came up as a word in something that we were reading. And she said, I don't really know what that means. It means kind of, it, she sort of gave some sort of vague definition. I'm like, oh, it means anti-clockwise. <laughs> and she's like, What? No, it doesn't. How do you know that? And I'm like, it does. And she's going, hmm, okay. And then she came in the next day and she looked it up and she said, it does mean anti-clockwise. You're very clever. I was like, why does no one else read Terry Pratchett? So you learned it from Terry Pratchett. I did learn it from Terry Pratchett, yeah. And that worked out for you because like, when I tried to draw upon pop culture to answer questions in school, um, the the teacher was asking how big the the Milky Way was and I drew from Monty Python's Universe song and it was wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah. Uh, it's, Isn't 40 million light years side is high? And she's like, no. No, 40,000. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I don't know if I said is. it wrong or if, if that's still wrong, but it's, yeah. It's reasonably accurate, that song. Okay. Not entirely. Yeah. Anyway, we started on Witter Shins. That was All right, sorry. quite a long I was just sitting back, just like, you two can do whatever you need to. <laughs> no. Well, it, you know, this is, this is where we meet our protagonist, Dom Salabos. <laughs> Who is, you know, he's a young dude, apparently. He's mm. just out having a bit of a, a swim in the swamps of his home planet. It feels weird being on a different planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you think of the start of the book, Will? I, look, it's, it, it reminded me of reading Terry Pratchett for the first time. I remember just being thrown through a loop reading it as a kid, just being like, I don't understand what the hell is going on and like rereading certain paragraphs over and over and over again. And then until I sort of understood where I was and grasped what was actually being said. Mm. And I only really felt that as a kid. And then going back on my rereads, I was like, oh, you know, younger Will was such a dumbass. Like, this is so clear. <laughs> but rereading reading this for the first time, I was like, oh, there's that feeling again. <laughs> I feel like I don't know what's happening. And so by the end, I sort of got the gist of it. And then, yeah. Yeah. Was- it does throw a lot of ideas at you very quickly. Well, Everything I've, has a weird word. Yeah, I felt like I was drowning in words, except the the words weren't a nice body of water reassuring me. It was just lots of different things that I couldn't keep in my head. And I was this close to making myself a glossary, and I was like, that's too much. I shouldn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, You could have. That could, could have come in very handy. But, we, I mean, there is a lot of words used to describe yeah. things and then they're kind of explained, but then they're explained later. Yeah. He does a lot of introducing a thing and then not explaining what it is until later in this yeah. book. Because he's, he's... Or ever. Around. Or ever. <laughs> yeah. Dom, Dom does... I mean, he does a lot of things, uh, but he's swimming around uh, on these things, these Dagon shells that, I mean, there's our first reference for the book, a bit of uh, Lovecraft in there. I read it as a dragon shell initially, initially and I was like, oh, that's cool. And then, no. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then... The, the which are these weird sort of shell like things with mm. tendrils and sharp shell. I'm like, how many ways to kill you does one beast need? Yeah. And I'm like, maybe he visited Australia at some point. I was about to say, we live in Australia. Like, yeah. come on. But what really annoyed me was I was like, okay, they're setting this up. At some point, there will be a payoff to this scene. <laughs> and it was just not there. I just, yeah, for me, it's Terry Pratchett was clearly very in love with this world and wanted to tell us absolutely everything about it. But. I think, look, I really enjoyed that, but I think that's partly because I used to read quite a few books a bit like this when I was young, around the time I would have been first reading Pratchett. I remember Mm. there's one in particular called Gilpin's Space, which is this weird sci-fi about these guys who, these humans invent a a star drive basically, but they don't have a spaceship to put it in, so they put it in a submarine, which is the only thing they've got that they can take into outer space, and it works. Uh, and there's all these weird sequences of what they see when they're going through hyperspace, which is not dissimilar to some of the stuff mm. you see um, when they're going through interspace in this book. And I, and it was, you know, it was a weird mass market paperback thing that I found in a Kmart for a dollar, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but I really dug it. I just liked those weird flashes of oddness. And I think I, I really enjoyed that about this book. Mm. But I can, I see what you mean, though, yeah. Can I say something from the very beginning? Because I'm, I'm worried I'm going to make like little snide comments if I don't. Um, I liked parts of this book, but I didn't like it as a book. 
it didn't feel cohesive. I felt the plot was very patchy and it was a bit over the top with names and stuff. I say that with love because there's a lot of things that clearly spawned later Pratchett things, but overall I didn't really like it. Is this the first for you with the Pratchett? As in, I feel like this about this book, about how I thought I felt about Rincewind, like, hmm. yeah, if that makes sense, like it's just the 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 one that like it's part of the family, but like if we're at a function, it's the if I didn't have to speak to it, um, wouldn't be terrible. Wow. Okay. You don't want to be sat next to it at the dinner table. Yeah, and it's not because I don't like it. It's just that I like other things better. You don't have anything to talk about. Mm. Yeah, and I feel real mean saying that because like, it's, right. it's part of the canon, but yeah. it's also very patchy. Yeah. Will, how did, do you feel I'm, the same? I'm in the same boat. I feel like he was sort of figuring out the things that he loved and then just sort of threw everything in there, but... A good editor would have been like, okay, but what's the story holding all of this together? Mm. And if something doesn't service the story, then cutting it and trimming it. But I could see this being a 40 or 50 page novel and not a 200 page mm. novel. Um, so, but there were parts of it that I really loved. Like, mm. I'm sure we'll get to them later, but I felt it was really lacking those real human moments where you could see yourself in the characters rather than just like, oh, okay, you're going to sprout an encyclopedia at me and you're going to tell me where we're going next and we're going to go there. Yeah. If that makes sense. I didn't, there was no story for me to really cling on and get swept up into. Yeah, I, th- I can see that. And I think that, you know, we've talked about this when reading The Colour of Magic that it's a very different tone, although mm. I, I still think quite an assured and, and great tone, but this feels, I mean, it's obviously earlier than that and it does, and it does feel a bit yeah. earlier. I think I I think the ideas in this book are things that I really like and I think that probably biases me a bit to enjoying yeah. it more but I totally see where you're coming from because the, the plot does feel pretty straightforward there there aren't those human moments yeah. as you say um it's it's all about big ideas and and some of it seems a bit kind of I don't know I I actually think the plot is perfectly fine Kind of up until the end, which yeah. which we'll get to. What happened? Man? Man. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get yeah. there. Don't blow the gap. <laughs> people haven't read it. I don't know. You know, this, this does make me wonder, like whether this structure is fine for people. I mean, no, it's not like anybody's reading the book while they're listening to the podcast. Yeah. So but, I guess it doesn't matter if we spoil. But maybe the they are. Like, maybe they are. Quick, turn the page. They're talking. <laughs> we should, I feel like we should be reading. But it this to them. could be one of the first books where they could actually read at the speed of the podcast and Absolutely. get to the end in time. As, well, yeah, it is very short. It's so very Please try that. And look, I've got one of the earlier Corgi editions, and it's only about 160 pages long. Um, and because it's got as much, I, I, I saw caught a glimpse of your copy, uh, Liz, and it, it's it's got much bigger prints than mine. <laughs> um, so yeah, which I thought was interesting. But it's um, you know, as I say, it was first published in 1976. But then after the Discworld became a success, and the first few books were published, it got republished in about 88, um, and then it got published again with the second Josh Kirby cover. But, we'll come back to the cover, I think. But yeah, it's good that you like it. Otherwise, this would be like a a, a loving grumble fest, um, <laughs> which I don't think would be good. But the way I felt about this book is it's kind of like an edible primordial soup. Like if you could <laughs> eat primordial soup, most of it you wouldn't want to, but there's like occasional good bits. Right. Like, you know, when you're eating normal soup and like most of it's boring. It's got nutrients it's in it. I think it's really fascinating because for me, Terry Pratchett has always been an author that can do no wrong or at least and when he does do wrong he does wrong on a completely different sort of level to a normal human failing like his <laughs> failures are our successes like i aspire to be his to write his worst book oh, so he's yeah. like the right. small god of writers yeah <laughs> yeah but the big thing is with this one it was a really fascinating look into his process so i'm like okay i can see all the ideas i can see the thinking man behind everything mm. but there are some things he hasn't quite learnt to do yet or hasn't built up the skill set to do really really well so for me like i'm sure i will go back to this there are some scenes that i really enjoyed and i actually agree with you i love the ideas in it mm. but some of the other parts felt half baked for me yeah mm. that's fair enough well, look, let's let's get through the the plot then, um, 
as quickly as possible. <laughs> right, uh, assassination perhaps. attempts. Um, that is pretty much what happens. I mean, we, we get introduced to a lot of ideas. We get them thrown at us in that kind of, here's a book telling you about the world, <laughs> so here's an extract about it. World building 101. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, and look, I kind of liked that. Uh, it's, it's, it's just so delightfully yeah. old school. Yeah. You know, it felt very Asimov, which this book is clearly very influenced by his writing. I was annoyed by them at first and then got really sad when halfway through the book I stopped getting sort of textbook, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of excerpts thrown at me. So You, you thought you hated them, but you were like, yeah. oh, I'm it was, digesting It was a this. great reprieve where you're like, okay, I've read 10 pages of chapter, now I get 10 pages of idea. And yeah. then it just stopped and it was like, my dad abandoned me all over again. Oh, no. <laughs> Mm. Uh, but we do learn in the first that first chapter um, quite several things that are important to the plot. First of all, that there is a mysterious, now vanished race of um, wonder builders known mm. as the Jokers, um, just as there are in nearly every space opera. Um, in fact, the only one I can think of that doesn't have them is Star Wars. Yeah. That's about it. They're in everything else. Uh, it's just a, such a tradition. But it would have still been fairly new. And actually, there's some stuff in this book, speaking of Star Wars, that because this was published a year before the first Star Wars film came out. So this is like, there's some stuff in here that I'm like, did George Lucas read this book? <laughs> like, Is it like uh, how um, Yoda's in E.T.? Or and the other way around or something? Oh, no. no. They're, they're in each other's movies. They are. But that was, that, that was by agreement. E.T.'s not in Star Wars before E.T.'s in E.T. No, no. He's in, he's in Star Wars much later. E.T.'s yeah. in Phantom Menace. Yeah. Yeah. And he looks like E.T. is like a senator. <laughs> <laughs> there are three E.T. senators. Oh, because they've been ambassadors because they've yeah. gone to Earth. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well the, the Earth ambassador, to, to, that doesn't make any sense. It's long ago. Anyway. This, <laughs> Sorry. Gonna... Don't, don't try and make those fictional worlds work together. Um, but in this one we learn, yeah, we learn about the Jokers. Uh, we learn that Dom is... Uh, about to become chairman of his whole planet, which is how the planets are ruled in the human sort of sphere. Uh, we learn that humans are considered not just to include humans from Earth, but also at least a few other races, including the Phnobes. And they and kept adding more through the whole book. <laughs> well, they do. And I was like, what? <laughs> but most of them are not humans. Like this is, this is, I mean, we'll come back to this because it's one of the questions. But um, yeah, there's this interesting idea that humanity is not just humans from Earth. It's like other people count yeah. as human as well. I drew a chart. So there's like man is the middle sized one. Phnobes is the tallest one. And I've written something that looks like bronk, which is wrong, but drunk. D- oh, Don't? Yeah, oh, yeah Drosks. Yeah. Drosks. Yeah. Okay, this is my handwriting. They're the bigger ones. The Drosks are the biggest ones. The dr- Drosks are the little ones. They start off little, but they get big. Ah. Yeah. See, I missed that in all Phnobes, of... Phnobes aren't that big. Phnobes have three, the big brains. three genders, uh, and the brainiest ones are the creeps. <laughs> well, those, uh, with the plural is actually creepy eye. Or what, creep the creepy eye, eye of Phnobes? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get creeps and the joke behind creeps until they said creepiness, and I'm like, uh, oh, my God. Yeah. How did I miss that for three quarters of a book? It's a pun. There's some, there's, there are some really full on, like as in maybe a little too full on puns yeah. in this book as well. Well, I thought there was a character called Parmigiana, but Ben tells me it's not. So. No. <laughs> it's not his name. Um, King Palmer. No, it's not his name. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we learned that and we, um, and we also learned that uh, someone's trying to kill Dom because he is almost immediately... Someone tries to assassinate him mm. um, with some sort of crazy explosion uh, or a, a stripper. They call him, <laughs> is that what they call it? Yeah, they call them strippers. Yeah, which makes sense because then when he uses the full term, it's molecule stripper. But then every other time, it's like he's threatened with a stripper. You're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> is that is that supposed to be a It's joke? a hen's night. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've um, never been invited to a hen's night, so if anyone's getting married, I'm available. I have been invited to a hen's night, <laughs> and it? it sounds terrible. No, I'm, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. There's going to be a boat, and we're going to be trapped on it. Oh, several right. other hen's nights, and they had to get special permission for me to be the only guy on board, and it's going to be a nightmare. And I'm like, we don't want to do, like, the penis straws things, do we? And they're all just like, yeah, and I'm like, oh. Oh, so no. It's gonna, I'll be live tweeting that. Yeah, please do. Yeah. The, the best ones I have... Uh, the best bachelor parties I've been to have been ones that have met up with the hens night later in the night for karaoke. And that's happened twice. <laughs> and it was awesome. I've also <laughs> never like, done karaoke. Liz. Yeah, I know. We should, should we, we fix that? A, or is a it a life experiences book club where every week we take you out. <laughs> and we do a thing. A special guest <laughs> takes you out to experience something. And then... Just trap me on a boat with all the hens night is that while we do karaoke. You, is that a thing you want to do? Because if it's not, it's okay. But if it is, I'll, I'll go with you. It's cool. 
Go, go to karaoke? Yeah. I have to be in the right mood. Okay. So be on call. So you've never been you've never been in the right mood? Is well, that I've what you're never, saying? No, I've been in the right mood, but I haven't been invited, and I've been invited but not in the right mood. Oh, okay. But the invitations have been like, this is very off topic. Um, but well, yeah. you, you don't have to be. Uh, you, you, you can just tell me you're in the right mood for karaoke, and I'll just go with you. It's okay. fine. All right, we'll do that. I'm making that pact right now. All right, but you got you got to say how um he's feeling about his job as chairman because I've got a joke I want to make. Okay, well he's <laughs> he's not feeling great about it. He's, he's so he's not so much a dom as a sub. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, he doesn't want to be in charge. That's, that's very good. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know if it's relevant. I, I feel like he's always called Dom in the book, but you do see his full name at one point, and <laughs> it's it's Dominic Daniel, like as one word. And I'm like, what? Why? <laughs> I mean, okay, fine. I don't know. I, I quite anyway because he loves the detail of the world. Yeah. That's, that, once you look yeah. at it through that lens, it makes sense. It does. Yeah. It does. Um, and I love I love just all of the little bits that he throws in here. Like Dom Dom gets nearly killed by this uh, molecule stripper gun. <laughs> And uh, he gets rescued by a Fnob who is a Pilak smuggler. Pilak never comes back again in the book. It's not that important. But it's, it's the basis of their like the basis wealth, of their wealth and their government. Well, up, and, up until they discover the weird green mold, which, goo, can re- goo goo. which they can turn into goo goo that regrows people's limbs and entire bodies if there's at least a little So it's penicillin, but better, right? It's, it's like um, Cause it kinda, mold. Well, it's kind of like... In the latest Star Wars, well, in some of the Star oh, Wars spin-off, no, how dare you use that word? <laughs> no, but in some of the later Star Wars spin-off stuff, with it set much earlier, like the Tales of the Old Republic stuff, um, they have like a precursor to the back to tanks that you see in the Star Wars films, and it's like this green goo rather than a clear liquid. Um, and it's, I wonder if again, did George Lucas read this or someone or R. L. Stein? Because yeah. his oh, font yeah. is the goo. Okay. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so he, he gets rescued and learns a few things. Gets um, a pet. And he gets given, yeah, he gets given a swamp egg, which is described as a sort of weird little shrew reptile thing. And he names it egg like a child names it's Teddy Teddy, which I did. So I can't, I, it's okay for me to mock children who did that. Cause... Oh, yeah. Well, I had, I had a teddy bear that was blue and I called it Bluey. So, you know, it wasn't exactly... Mind blowing creativity. How about you, Will? Do you have any toys as a kid that you gave stupid names to? No, no toys. <laughs> I lived a joyless life. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. So we're going to have to take me to karaoke and buy you a bunch of toys. <laughs> Stuff toys. <laughs> that sounds wrong, but okay. <laughs> what are you? I'm, I'm, I'm too scared to find out what you're going to do. I told for you. Me. Sense of humor from Terry Pratchett. That's. <laughs> Okay. Uh, welcome to our filthiest episode yet, everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, but uh, he he gets home. Uh, he gets in trouble from the head of security, whose name is Corridor, which yeah. I really liked because I don't know if you um, you might not be old enough, Liz, uh, or, or maybe not even you. But I can forget how old I am. I'm very old. But back in the eighties, there was this claymation short that got shown on the ABC called Plasmos Hatch Day. Oh, they showed that in the nineties. Well, they re- they made a series out of it in the nineties. I think. Okay. Um, so it might have actually been in the nineties that it was shown. But um, one of the bounty hunters who's trying to find the character Plasmo in that is named Corridor. <laughs> it just made me think of him, and I think Corridor is the one who speaks with a sort of a slight lisp and really likes party pies. And he's like, party pie? I just love party pie. And he's like supposed to be this intergalactic bounty hunter. It's hilarious. So I found it a bit hard to take Corridor seriously. But he is he is one of those competent characters that you enjoy. And here's where I was like, oh, his own people are plotting to kill him. They were the ones who tried to assassinate him. It's going to be this whole assassination book in a different way. And then that was not it. But we we get past that bit and eventually we get to... Just before his investiture, he gets some presents. He gets some toys. Sorry. Mm. (laughs) Uh, Which includes some cool gear. He gets some cool stuff. It was very much like the start of a Dungeons and Dragons sort of adventure where you get to gear up before you go out to fight the monsters. He gets <laughs> he gets his gifts for his investiture as chairman and he gets like a cool pair of flying sandals and he gets a cool sword that can change shapes and he gets a, a, a cool hollow cube that's like a book about the Jokers written by his tutor, the Fnob. But what frustrates me is, don't they mention in that bit that it's like he has to give all these gifts back? He can't use them. And then he goes on to 
use half of the gifts in the rest of the book or is it yeah. just when this they're... This is friend gifts, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah I got the impression that the ones that from people the, he actually knew he could keep. That was the rule that I sort of imagined for myself to sort of stop mm. that from breaking. Yeah, I don't actually remember if that's that's specific, like explicit, but I yeah, I yeah. think that's how it worked. Because his grandmother's like, you don't want to owe like the mm. CEOs and stuff, like the chairman of other things, favours mm. yeah. and things, so he can't have the robot horses. Yeah. Yeah, but he gets the cube from Hirsch Hagen. He's, he's one of the unpronounceable. There's quite a lot of unpronounceable names yeah. in this book. I'm so glad he gave that up. Oh, but we're going to do the quack one. Oh, we are? Yeah. We're not up to that yet, though, yeah, are we? Yeah, that's on page 88. Okay, it is I good, enjoyed, I enjoyed reading those out loud, though. Yeah. yeah. That is fun, yeah. I was in an Uber while reading half of this, so I did not read them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will have that joy on the podcast. I will, I will lead. You know? <laughs> oh, and his sister gives him a robot friend. Mm. Who wants to be a slave? Oh man, how do, what do we got to say about that sequence? Because I quite like Isaac the robot. He's he's got some sass on him. You can't have a dom without a slave, really. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's too. It's the the text. The text supports the theory. <laughs> What's happening? He oh, knows man. what he's doing. Actually, I this, think, that's, I think that, he does. Yeah, that's a dirty joke. Yeah, that is. That's what that is. And you know what this. Because that subservient stuff is never brought in again. Yeah, that's true. Mm. It's just a joke. It's to service a joke. Yeah, it is. And he's he's like, uh, yeah. And he also is like, but I like when he's like, oh yeah, be more chill around me or be more relaxed around me. And Isaac being relaxed is like me trying to relax at a party. He's like, (laughs) okay, boss. Yeah, you just throw a cool word in at the end, and we're relaxed. Yeah, I'm having a a cool time, (laughs) and everyone's like. A cool time, really. <laughs> Just yeah. a, a fun, hip, rad time. Yeah, that's good. Uh, but I did, I did like Isaac because I, I like, I like a good robot, and I, I liked that he didn't really. He kind of avoids the standard robot tropes. Mm. Like he's not overly logical and cold, and he's also not like really uptight as a robot butler, like you know, like C three PO or yeah. um, Crichton or something. Um, he just he's his own character and yeah. he's you know named after Isaac Asimov presumably yeah yeah he's my mvp like he he was in my favorite scene so i i stand yeah. isaac yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that was a sequel <laughs> we need an isaac sequel i would read the whole spin off series of isaac's just adventures like his prequels like just little little novellas that kind of thing by the merch <laughs> <laughs> by the merch yeah i mean i think it'd be good merch yeah i'd love to know what he looks like I don't think he looks like the robot on the cover of the the first Josh Kirby cover. Is he? He's not on. Yours, I don't think I don't Josh think. Kirby mm. ever like gets the illustration. Like they look great, but they're never correct. Mm. Yeah, like, he's more interested in what's happening in the book than descriptions yeah. of the characters. I think, yeah. which is fine. I mean, because he gets some pretty interesting things, but he does sometimes pick some unusual scenes to put on the cover. Mm. Yeah, like boobs, and he just adds boobs. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. See, I've got the cover with no boobs. Is are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I looked. Is there a hidden boob? So that sounds really perverse. Just I looked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, right. I read about Dom and then I checked for boobs. <laughs> oh, it's all gone wrong. Uh, <laughs> Whenever we record at night, <laughs> I have <laughs> corrupted this podcast. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the gang is kind of assembled, um, but during the ceremony of his investiture as chairman, he gets absolutely blown up and not just him also his security chief corridor um and not just blown up but blown up by a miniature black hole yeah. <laughs> like it's like how much more dead could you be just like blown in yeah 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 um but just enough of him survives by some miracle that he can be regrown out of goo goo and now he yeah. is green i thought it was interesting because you know the, all the characters on widdershins they're described as a bunch of humans who all now have jet black skin they have no hair because yeah. they're living on this planet which is super hot there's um and there's very little land mass it's mostly swamp and water um and so they've you know evolved to match the the climate mm. there um, but then the protagonist who looks like that is almost immediately converted into a weird green dude. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the rest of his family presumably still look like that, but it was yeah. it just felt a bit weird. With to... long hair. Yeah, that's right, because it grows his hair. But I was like, he's like, oh, no, the hair. I'm like, why can't you just shave it off if you don't like it? Yeah, he could. But he doesn't, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. But yeah, it was the whole Fifth Element scene where he has to like be made back from nothing into mm. a thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it takes like four months, and there's that sort of sequence where he's having weird dreams. My favorite part of which is Isaac like coming to him in his dream and telling him all of the weird like versions of all the other like epic stories of the chosen one, <laughs> including like versions of like Dune and like I think there's a Ringworld one in there. There's like yeah, it's just just oh. a book of Isaac, please. Yeah, like, I love that. That was mm. great. But it was what really struck me about the beginning of the book is how much the plot relied, at least at the beginning, on um, Dom having information kept from him. It's mm. basically that really big trope that you get in sort of younger fantasy novels, like whenever J.K. Rowling was sort of padding out one of the books, it'd be like, someone's keeping a secret from Harry. And that would be it. And so there was a lot of that going on at the very beginning. I was like, oh, and I was just, I was itching for it to sort of move a little faster. And so that's when I really sort of glued onto the uh, world building sort of segments. Yeah. They, yeah. They do that to us a bit with the, oh, the one law of yeah. Wittershins and they tell us what it is and that's it. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Well, there is only one. Yeah, but so. like there was like built up. I was like, this is going to be like the climactic scene. They're like, yeah. oh, no, so you won't waste things. I was like, all right. Yeah. And then they will have a nice meal. I thought, I thought it was didn't very... come back. Yeah. There was no sort of payoff. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I, I enjoyed Which finding out what it was. Which is counter to the one law. Because <laughs> you oh. feel like it was wasted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I'll pay that. Sure. Oh, that was good. Well no, played. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but look, once once Dom wakes up and he's got his new body, uh, he kind of demands to know what's going on. And it turns out the reason they haven't told him about any of this stuff is that his dad was one of the experts in probability math, or P-math for short, which is kind of like a much more mathematical version of Isaac Asimov's psychohistory from the Foundation novels, um, which is like a mathematical means of predicting the future. But in this book is about kind of predicting which one of, of a variety of alternate universes you are most likely to be in um, is kind of how they sort of express it and uh, that they knew he was supposed to die on his the day of his investiture and his dad had figured this out and left a recording for him and as they play it to him because they're like well you didn't die you survived you've come back from the dead so I guess you can watch this now there's an extra bit that's like there's also a really tiny chance that you might not die and if you do you should pay attention to this bit also look out for that thing in the corner which I love that as a thing when there's a prediction that is then immediately useful it's very Mrs. Cake and there's also like the whole, is it from Guards Guards as well where there's the million to one, billion to one thing paying off? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Million to one chances crop up nine times out of ten. Yeah. Except in this one it's like billions to one, yeah. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's there's some ideas there that will become, uh, again, useful and interesting later in Pratchett in some ways. But he decides he's he's going to do something with his life. He's going to figure out what's going on and... He is predicted that he might be someone who finds Joker's world, the secret home of the Jokers. And so he sets off on a quest, which is pretty much what he does for the rest of the book, is go around looking for clues. Well, his grandma chases him around in a ship. Yeah, his grandma chases him first to the um, first Syrian bank, uh, who is his godfather and also a planet and also a bank. (laughs) It's like all of those things. But also manifests as a robot smoking a cigar. Yeah, just to keep you at your ease. It's like it's like that trope where you know they you have some monstrous creature and they're like, oh, but I'm going to turn into a like in that that recent Lord of the Rings video game where they decided that because you were going to work for Shellob, they wouldn't put a dirty great spider in. Instead, she'd turn into like an attractive woman, and you're like, why? Like in Harry Potter, they're like, we want Nagini to be in this, but we don't want Nagini to be a snake. We're going to make her an Asian woman. Oh yeah, and we're not going to let her change her outfit for the whole movie. I forgot about and that. Her one role is to stare lovingly at this character that we're not invested in that died in the last movie, but we haven't explained why he's not dead now. Yeah, and also search engine optimization has really ruined things because I was trying to look up what Credence meant and the first thing that came up was this character's like character wiki and I'm like, go away. Oh. No one cares. Poor Ezra Miller. Mm. As in, Ezra Miller's good, but he's playing... A, his character sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I haven't seen the second one, so I don't really know. You basically know what just have, deal. like, you've just watched it by Yeah, hearing. I don't really feel like I want to. <laughs> it's fascinating, whereas it's kind of like J.K. Rowling, but she hasn't learned how to write well. It's like the inverse of this book. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Is what okay. I'm getting at. It's yeah. like if I should write this it's, like yeah. two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You'd be like, what is happening? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah well, I mean, this is, yeah, he goes to the bank. 
he gets some clues from the bank. He almost gets assassinated by the same guy who blew him up before, this weird human dude in so, a blue cloak. Is there a fight in this scene? Because they later talk about there being a fight, but really it seemed like a guy touched his shoulder and then they left. Yeah. Well, well, the guy like grabs him and then he backs away from the guy and a robot grabs him. And then he drops a robot on the ground. Is that really a fight? Well, he escapes by flying and the robot falls. I think it qualifies as a fight. Like He's running away. People no, are for me it was him. running away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. when I got to that bit at the end, it's like, oh, you know, and I remember my good times, you know, that fight at the bank. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> No, it was, yeah, it was a scuffle, maybe. I don't know. Well, they did grab, I mean, because his grandmother's also there and she grabs um, her shagun at that point. I just enjoy saying it. I have no idea if that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. I liked it. I would go with her shagun. Her shagun, that, yeah. yeah. Okay, you have to say it with confidence and I cannot. But he he is grabbed, they escape from the bank and then they go to band, uh, which I really like this sequence. Like, I, This is one of my favourite bits of world building mm. is that the planet's called Band because it's mostly water but then there's a thin band of really tall sort of mountains and, and countryside right around the equator but then also you're not allowed <laughs> to land there and they explicitly say, mm, another reason why you might call it Band. <laughs> which in a later book would probably have been a footnote, I think. Yes, there are no footnotes in this book and it's got chapters. Yeah. yeah. It's just such a weird non pratchety experience in so many ways. But I also just really, like, I think the sun dogs were one of my favourite things in the yeah. book. I loved them. Like, I kept imagining, like, something from Adventure Time and I'm like, yeah, this is this is nice. I can picture this. And it was, yeah, and it felt like the sequence was sort of thought out in a way that the others weren't. And right. there was, they focused on the right things in the scene. Like, there were some sequences where I was like, why are we listening to this conversation? And then things like the kerfuffle at the bank are just so sort of swept under the rug in three lines. Like the focus of what he was writing was sort of off, but here sort of everything was working in sync in a really wonderful way. The humor was there. The characters were there and the other characters had something to do. Mm. Whereas the plot sort of happens to everyone a lot in this book, but here there was some agency, which I guess that's the problem of having a novel that's based on fate and probability. So he sort of boxed himself in in terms of the themes, but here everything sort of was working well. Yeah, I, and I mean, you were talking about Isaac being the MVP. This, yeah. this is the yeah, this scene is the scene. This is it, yeah, there's, oh. it's so yeah, just all of it. Yeah, he beats up the other robots uh, because we- Dom's grandmother has followed them to band. Uh, and so they're like, well, we've got to get our mate back from her spaceship. And then uh, just, I, and as well as that sequence, which is fantastic with Isaac, he's just smashing the other robots and then disguising himself as one and grabbing the other guy. It's brilliant. But I also just really love the whole um, ecology of the sun dogs, which is just, you find out, I think you find out everything you need to know about them in this book. And it's just the right amount of weirdness and explanation. Like you're never quite sure what they're made of but they live in space and they can travel through into space, which is like this book's version of hyperspace. But they lay their eggs in orbit and they hatch them by them like falling through the atmosphere with built-in parachutes and then smashing into the ground and blowing up. And that's when the sun puppy comes out. I just love there was this one line about all these younger pups that were waiting. They had learnt to lie with their paws over their eyes yeah. when things were showing. And I thought that was a beautiful bit of world building. Now, I want to know... Was any of that sort of mentioned in like a textbook sort of thing or was it just integrated into the plot? It's just integrated into the main text from memory, yeah. That's why it was so much better as well because everything we were learning, we were learning organically and it was necessary and it added to the scene. Like the eggs dropping from the sky, that was a threat that he Mm. then had to sort of, you know, navigate. Yeah, and it propels Dom into the lake, which is how he meets... Chattagaster, who's the person that the bank has sent him to see, who turns out to be an intelligent body of water, and which I, I thought was nice that they're like, you know, there's this intelligent body of water, there's an intelligent rock planet. Um, they say that they've met an intelligent sun and now they just want to find an intelligent bit of gas so they can complete the element. It's like the group. fifth element, yeah. Yeah, and then they just need an intelligent feeling, I guess, <laughs> intelligent love. I don't know. It's just such a thing exist. Mm. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, I I thought that sequence was great, and and then Chattagaster sort of like just talks to him and says maybe you should think about this some more, um, and gives him some clues, and they escape by riding some of the the older sun puppies that are now old enough to escape the planet up into orbit, 
and getting a, a hitching another ride on some sun dogs elsewhere, which I thought was was pretty cool. I did like the big, smart, benevolent water. Yeah, that was a a nice scene, and I enjoyed the bits where he was like, the communication is not translatable. I thought that was good because there was quite a lot of over explaining from time to time, and just letting your imagination go in those bits was very nice. Yeah, yeah, and it was it just it was just so weird, and I think. Overall, like the thing I really enjoyed most about this is just how weird everything was, because it really kind of and, and I think there's not necessarily everything in it is completely original, but I think there's so many remixes and there are so many ideas that I've certainly not seen anywhere else that I just was constantly like, "What a weird, cool idea! What a weird, cool idea!" And I was like, "Yeah, keep throwing them at me, Terry. I want to walk weird, cool ideas." Um, so I was I was really into that. Mm. I just loved when they went up to the other sun dog and that sun dog, you know, was basically pissed at them for endangering the other sun pups. And I thought, oh, that was a really nice, and that was that sort of, there was a really nice human moment there coming through and it was it was good for a laugh. From one mm. of the least human kind of yeah. characters. Yeah. And I love just like the conflict resolution was just constantly, okay, I'll pay you money via the bank. Yeah, because I'm the chairman of an entire planet that's like, quite wealthy. I can it, do that. It feels very prescient now reading it with sort of how corporate sort of the structure of the planets were and how one of our central characters is literally a bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the way that they resolve problems is literally throwing money at it. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it, it's interesting that our, you know, the, this mega rich like chairman of a huge corporation is our likable protagonist. <laughs> like, I don't know that later in his life, Terry Pratchett would ever have written that kind of, that that as a character, you know, because his characters in later books are very much the underdogs always. Yeah, because they have that whole thing about, like, he has, jumping back at his at his chairman thing that he does, mm. he gets to choose his meal and he chooses, like, a simple bread and water, but because of where they are, that's really difficult to get all the things. So yeah. there's that great line that some kinds of simplicity cost more than others which i thought was oh pretty yeah because they like melt the water off a comet for his glass of water that he's having and the fish has come from it's not a local fish it's from another planet as well and yeah, yeah. it cost two thousand standards whereas that ride on the sun dog cost 17 standards yeah so that's you've got to imagine that's expensive to travel from one place to another like that <laughs> i like this jam tastes like fish to caviar <laughs> Oh, only the poorest people eat that on our planet. Yeah, well, it's an ocean planet. There's a lot of there's a lot of fish. You would imagine it's like kale it's flipped around. <laughs> it's like it's like it's across the streams between my podcasts. It's like the uh, Saru, who's an alien character on Star Trek Discovery, is a kelpian, and the first time you see images of them on their own planet, they're literally gathering seaweed <laughs> to eat, and you're like, this is a bit on the nose, surely. Anyway, I don't know. It just reminded me of that. Mm, that's good. Uh, but they they leave they leave band behind. They head off to the Chain Star, which is you know sort of a Ringworld kind of esque weird monument where they've shaped two stars into circles linked in each other, kind of like a basically like a cosmic magician's <laughs> trick, which I thought was kind of cute. To meet with the the creeps who live there um, and get some more clues as to what's going on. Uh, and I, I, what did you think of this sequence? Because there's some weird stuff that's gone on there. I thought they were going to be in space for like a million years and then get back to their planets and everyone was dead. But I don't know like why my brain kept trying to concoct other books where it wasn't going to go because it seemed like that was going to be a thing. But Really? Oh, yeah. I didn't, get, I didn't get that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't get that. So maybe I was reading a different book. No, um, I don't know. <laughs> no. Was it good? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm going to write this book and it's going to be so good. But I just gave away the ending, so forget it real quick. Okay, well, I'll edit it out so that nobody knows the ending. Actually, Diana Wynne Jones already wrote that book. So. <laughs> Were you accidentally reading a Diana Wynne Jones book? <laughs> well, it's Diana Wynne Jones March, isn't it? Isn't that what, what's happening anyway? I don't know. That's, okay. I don't know. That's everyone's answer to everything. It's... Diana Wynne Jones already wrote it. Yeah. 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 Lord of the Rings is done. <sighs> Human centipede, uh, Vitamin Jones. Like, oh, 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 why would you say that? Uh, but look, uh, in, in between this, we also find out who the assassin in the blue cloak is who's failed to kill Dom now by this stage of the book about four times. Um, he's a, a human robot, and a, a robot who's a class five, is class, classified as human, but built to look like a flesh and blood human, mm. uh, but also specifically engineered to be extremely lucky, which means he's always able to be in the right place at the right time to ambush Dom and he has killed 
hundreds, if not thousands, I can't remember how many it says in the book, of previous people who were predicted to be likely to find Joker's world. Um, but he just can't get one over on Dom. There's something protecting him. But he has stolen Ig, the Swamp Ig. And they, they, there's that moment where like they, they're talking, the, the chairman of the Joker Institute, who it turns out is behind all these assassinations because they don't actually want anyone else to find Joker's world, um, is like talking to the other members of the board on like an intercom. It just made me think of that James Bond film with like the, the quantum group. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I initially thought they were all like sharing, like they can just beam into your brain, like the chrysalids. I think that is what they're doing, yeah. I don't okay. think he's wearing anything. Mm-mm. Okay. But I think they're real people. I've never been so disappointed to be right. You're just like, oh, no, you were correct. I'm like, oh, but I have to figure out how I was wrong. But then, no, <laughs> I don't have to figure out how I was wrong. I can <laughs> just have to bathe in my victory. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. It's good. Um, but, yeah, that is, we find out all about him. And his name is Waze, and he, he wants to be free from them. And I thought, I don't know, that was sort of a weird sort of aside where I'm like, I'm glad I know who this guy is now. But also, now I feel like I know everything I need to know about him. Like he's got no mystery anymore. So, so this is a book about fate, right? And he's also got that yeah. collar that like forces him to do things. It's kind of like Monkey has the the headband where if yeah. he does if he does bad, it squeezes his head. Tripitaka's which the is headache sutra. Yeah. 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 Um. So, and this might be a long bow to draw, but Terry Pratchett wrote this when he was quite young, right, in his early twenties, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And a vibe that I picked up. There's a sense of like gloom and fate in a way that like dom is being forced to become the chairman of his planet and he doesn't seem to really want that and i was just wondering if it's like a young person's thing where you're worried that you have to get rid of your passions and just settle in for the dull life because that to me seemed like a thread like a undercurrent through the whole book in different ways like maybe not an overt theme but there was like fate is the big one but this is like a lesser version of it it's like being locked in by circumstance i certainly agree with you that there are those threads running through what it reminded me of is when i'm reading something that someone's written for school and the school has asked me to critique it i'm like oh i can see the unit of study that you're trying to tie everything into and that's what it reminded me of it reminded me of i thought maybe was he at university at this time maybe writing something I don't think he. I, well, I don't think he did go to university, so I. I don't think uh, he would have been. No, I think he did like an apprenticeship as a journalist, and sort of went and worked for the the local paper, hmm. um, and then got stuff published in it, and then became a writer that way. So yeah, uh, which which is not to invalidate your theory. Perhaps yeah. he felt like that while being I, trying to get into it. I yeah, I think I think he just had a set of ideas that he wanted to work through, and every sort of character passes through that prism in some way but to your point yes ways we he loses all that mystery but at the same time was he really that compelling a character to begin with Mm. i thought once i had that scene i'm like oh okay i see how this fits i get what they're saying and and there was that perfect balance it was almost like star wars where there was like both you know the villain and the hero were on this track and they didn't really want to be on it and they had no real reason for being on it but they were just sort of forced to go because that's the fate of it and there was the pressure of and dom ends up having the entire universe sort of following him in the same way that ways has the joker institute sort of pushing him and so Mm. they're both sort of moving towards a collision that i don't think they're that keen on Mm. yeah which is an interesting dynamic but i think you're right and then it doesn't quite pay off uh again unfortunately Mm. But this is where, you know, there's another assassination attempt and it's the, you know, the, the second most successful one, I suppose you could say. Is it the amazing one? Uh, the amazing one? Did you just make a really bad maze? Oh, I yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. How did I miss that? I watched, I watched the hope in the eyes and oh, you just no. missed it completely. And you just minotaur right through my feelings. Oh, no. I'm, yeah. I, uh, that, was, that was one pun too many. Yeah, no. Was, no. I, don't I wanna... should go home. <laughs> that's funny because we're in my home yeah okay thanks for explaining that joke to the audience in case they forgot um but you're right you're right it is amazing because they, they do go to minos the uh the planet that is a artificially constructed maze um in order to just to check it out and the weird thing about the maze is whenever you go into the maze you get your own version of the maze that's different to everyone else's version. Kind of the like maze. life. Yeah. Except for Waze, who manages to get into Dom's version of the maze and throws like a, 
a, I think he calls it like a, a, a naked matrix core or something. It's like the, the, one of the spaceship engines that they have invented by the creeps. Um, and he throws it at him, but it doesn't blow up straight away until it goes off into another bit of the maze. And so Dom isn't killed. He's just sort of injured and ends up outside the maze. But they also give him back his swamp egg before mm. they do that because previously they have put a bomb inside it. Mm. And I quite enjoyed the, the bit of the conversation where one of the other members of the board of the Joker Institute, when they're discussing this plan, is like, I don't really like this, but I suppose if it's the best way to kill him, then, you know, because I have several pets of my own. And you're like, oh, the human touch to the psychopathic corporate leaders of the universe. He's got but, the fluffy cat that he pats while he's on his swivel chair. Can we come back to this when we get to the ending? Yes. Because I have, I didn't really think about that in terms of the ending, and now that I'm, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay, There's we'll come back through. to it. Yeah, a breakthrough. Mm. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Dom, he survives, but he's badly injured. And when he wakes up, he's on Laoth or Louth. I wasn't quite sure how to say that. Louth. Louth. I thought maybe it was meant to be like Laos or Laos. Is, that, is, is he Laos? Is that how you're supposed to say it? Like the actual country on the planet Earth? I'm not sure. Actually. No, I don't know either. I've never been there. Do you know, Will? No, I am not worldly. Okay, but please tweet us how yeah. to say it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, they're on they're on Laoth, uh, which is a really hot, dry place where Dom's sister lives, uh, having married the emperor of the planet. And Tarmajan, <laughs> Tarmigan. His name is Emperor Tarmigan. Uh, you keep saying Parmesan. It looks like Parmesan. Well, I guess it does. It does. That's yeah. That's I can't deny that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he wakes up there, um, having been brought there and healed up from his injuries, um, because he's he's not indestructible, but he's pretty tough now that he's made of green goo. And he's found out previously in the book from the bank that the probability math says he's going to discover Joker's world in 27 days. And there's quite like every now and then they update you on how many days are left. And I'm like, really? Did we spend that many days? And I think most of it goes in this section when he's unconscious again. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, now the pressure's on and everybody knows. Everyone sort of figured out that this is what's happening and a whole bunch of people show up in orbit just to hang out and see what he's going to do, <laughs> I guess. And that's when we have this really weird bit of the book mm. where he just sort of encounters his well his step niece like the emperor's daughter um who his sister is married to the emperor hmm. um and they sort of flirt but she doesn't know any languages that he knows so his uh, her bodyguard a drosk bodyguard who's an enormous um female like that's right blocky drosk um she translates for them and they go off on this like ride on the robot horses out into the countryside <laughs> And then her brother shows up and they're just talking about how he's really good at with his sham sword, making him the second best shamurai on the planet. Oh, I just got that. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that's that's what it was all about. Um, was it all just for that? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then there's also there's also a gag where they're going to have like a sham fight. Uh, and it's like, it's not really a fight, uh, but, but with like training sticks. Does the winner get champagne? Yeah. Uh, Oh. Oh. See, it works on multiple levels because I will not explain it. Well, I mean, they both get dunked underwater, so they're probably going to need some shampoo for their hair. Mm. <laughs> you cannot, after half the things that you have said tonight, you cannot. Or indeed, judge in the preceding. I can and I did. <laughs> uh, you did, yeah. Um, but yeah, they they have the fight, and then Dom like cheats somehow. How does he cheat? Though? It's a total schmozzle. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> yes, no. it is. Thank you, Will. <laughs> I had to do it. Uh, yeah, you did. We're very pleased that you did. Um, mm. Yeah, because like the, he hits, says, hits his back when he's, he's the, he had his back turned. And so but he says anything hits. goes as long as you're using the sticks. But he explains he that he like, used gravity stick. in some way. Oh, yeah, his... I don't know. Oh, maybe he jumps at him with the sandals and so that's not using the sticks. So he pushes... Um, Charlie, that's the, the Emperor's daughter's name, he pushes her brother Tali. <laughs> They're not very imaginative with names. Um, he was running out by this point. He was like, right, I want to end this book. I've just randomly added down a ticking clock. and Yeah, and also let's have a pseudo-romance scene. Yeah. So we it can just kind of comes out of nowhere. Really well, see, this is it, right? My, my copy with the earlier illustration does not have that scene on it. It has, it has uh, Isaac... And Dom, and presumably Hirsch, and maybe Waze. It's not entirely clear. I think it's another robot, but he's wearing a blue robe, which is why I think yeah. it might be Waze. 
looking up at a Joker artifact through the window of what seems to be a big spaceship, hmm. which is not quite a scene in the book, but it does kind of illustrate the characters and some of the themes in the book, so it kind of works. But um, your your cover, again by Josh Kirby, a later one, um, has this scene where they're riding on their horses, followed by um, Charlie's Drosk bodyguard, and behind that, Tali on his robot horse. And it's really such just a minor part of the book, and it kind of comes out of nowhere. I, this is the this this was my least favorite scene mm. because I didn't quite understand it. Although, um, it, it kind of, it, something you said earlier made me think maybe it makes more sense because Dom kind of goes a bit nuts and wants to win in this scenario, mm. and Charlie kind of you know berates him for that, calls him a, a barbarian, um, and I don't know I. The, I I couldn't quite like it, the this sort of weird like oh I'm gonna flirt with this girl and go off for a ride on some horses we'd never met her she's yeah. your step niece I I it think weird. it's see I didn't read it as flirty so much as he was intoxicated by being seen as a hero mm, and you watched okay. everyone sort of giving him judgy eyes for you know overstating how heroic he was and so I think this is supposed to be a moment in his arc where he becomes more selfless and yeah, but I wasn't quite sure that Pratchett hit the mark in this. I sort of, Mm. I got a sense this is a character changing moment because it's after this when he's like, Oh, I know where I need to go now. And he moves on. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think we got any of that sort of arrogance beforehand. So it just sort of sprouts up in this scene. You see him get intoxicated by it, then attacking his step, nephew or, t- or whatever it was. Just nephew. I so. mean, yeah. Um, and look, when he's challenged, I mean, the challenge is like just a friendly, hey, do you want to have a go with some like fake swords? Yeah. Uh, and he sort of grudgingly accepts, like he doesn't really want to do it. And yeah. then, but then he tries really hard to win and almost drowns him in the lake. And Charlie like has that, like you idiot, like mm. I can't, I'm so angry with you. Mm. He, you know how he was saying that he's like the second best samurai on the planet. Guess who the best one is? It's me. Yeah. And, and I could cut your head off right now if I wanted. And also I could speak your language this whole time. I've just been watching you make a dick of yourself. And his most he mostly his acknowledgement of that is just he sort of he rides off thoughtfully, I think is is how yeah. it's described. And that and and it's not really clear what I, I just yeah, I, I see where you're going with that and yeah. I think you're right, but I, I I agree that it's not really sold to us. It's like a shoehorned in power corrupts sort of thing. It's a bit of a sham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe that's the whole point. I don't know. Um, but it is after this that he kind of sits down to dinner with everybody and uh, and and they just have a chat about all the ideas, all the theories. Because, we, I mean, we also, we haven't mentioned that they do drop the name of the book. Mm. Um, Several on. thousand times. Yeah. yeah. Well, at the start, it's because it's like the one bit of Joker stuff that they've been able to mm. decrypt and it's like a poem, but it, it tells us, that you know you'll find us on the dark side of the sun, and everyone's got their own ideas about what that means. And the clues that Dom's picked up through the book, he kind of puts them together, and it, it's sort of. Um, it's not. I mean, it's not like it's not. It's not the sort of thing where you read it and you go, "Oh yeah, I figured that out." Because it ends up that the dark side of the sun, or the the sun in that in that poem, is a uh, a metaphor for the light of intelligence, and that the Jokers have decided to shun that and move away from it. Um, but before we get to that, Dom decides like he kind of knows where he's got to go, and that's when Waze finally turns up, and not alone this time. Like he's got the entire fleet of the Joker Institute behind him, um, and demands that he goes. Like they figure out we can't stop you anymore, but we're going to watch you. So you got to get into this spaceship, which is like a weird like it's an engine with a cockpit strapped to it. It's like not a spaceship really, um, and we're going to be watching you. You better watch out. Um, which just seemed like a sort of, I don't know, how do we feel about that? Like that was kind of a weird, is he just sort of accepting like I've tried to kill you so many times and I can't, so if we can't, then we'll just have to let you do the thing that you're, you've been predicted to do, which is why we can't kill you, and then maybe we can kill didn't you. Didn't they keep his family hostage as well? Wasn't there that situation? So it was like we're going to yeah. add stakes to this, but there were no stakes in the scene at all. Like I didn't really mm. follow yeah, I'm not sure. I was really confused by this point, I have to confess. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, then you get the, the ending and yeah. the payoff 
or the <laughs> payoff. That's that's that that's the word we're using. <laughs> okay. All right. Look, okay. we get the conclusion of there the we book. Go. This is just the it. end of the book. The book stops. The final page, I think, is better than an <laughs> sure, end. Let's sure. say let's it say says the, final the page. end at it. It the does. End. It does. Um, and look, and what happens is uh, Dom realizes where he's got to go is back to Widdershins because the his domicile. The jo- <laughs> <laughs> oh, why? why? He was domestic the whole time. No. He's flying domestic yeah. and he had to go a ways before he got home. <laughs> Did you say a ways? <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, oh, oh, God, no. What's After happening? he realized his ignorance. Uh, well, oh, oh, well, also, I love you. <laughs> also, <laughs> after we as the readers discovered the error of ways, but also, oh. what has this book done to our brains? We're sitting there like <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, oh, we didn't do the quacking. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. But <laughs> but let's get to the end of the book because he realizes that yeah, the Jokers have turned away from intelligence. That's what it means that they're on the dark side mm-hmm. of the sun. They've turned away from the light of intelligence in order to make themselves simpler. Because what he learned from the creeps is that the creeps who are the second oldest race in the universe have been trying to get to know the universe from everybody else's point of view because they've realized that they can't understand the universe fully from a single point of view. They have to understand all the points of view possible in order to truly understand the totality, as they call it, which is their word for you know the vast multiverse of possible universes. Um, and so the Jokers went one better than that. Uh, because when they were alive, there were no other intelligent races for them to get another viewpoint from. So they kind of left all these little hints and turned themselves into non-intelligent animals and set up things so that maybe other intelligent races would arrive, but they wouldn't influence them too much so that they could develop their own points of view. And then when the time was right, they would be found and they could sort of switch back on their intelligence and talk to these other people and go, we want to know what your point of view is because that's the whole point of us having turned into mindless beasts for five billion years or however long it was. So, so yeah. So I'm going to like explain the pyramids to us then. Like, is that like an analog for that a bit? You mean and like the, Stonehenge and stuff? You mean like the ones that the jokers leave behind? Yeah, but like our version surely isn't that like pyramids and Stonehenge and like the weird things that people don't know why or how? I think we know why. We know why pyramids, but... We don't know how. Yeah. It's a great lister from Red Dwarf. They had whips. They had massive, <laughs> massive whips and a lot of people. Uh, but like the Stonehenge's stones come from really far away and they don't yeah. know how. Because they did that whole thing where they tried to recreate it and they couldn't. Uh, Even cheating with modern technology, isn't it? Because like the, they, they could have gotten local stones, but they're like, no, we need the weird far away stones. Yeah. Well, I always, I mean, look, my, my feeling about those things, I don't know that there's any scientific or archaeological evidence to back this up, but is that we always underestimate the ingenuity and talent and whips and whips of, of people in the past. Like they can do a lot of things and we might not know how they did it, but they did do it. And I don't think you need a, like a weird supernatural explanation for that. I think people are just, they're really good at doing well, stuff they really want to do. Stargate explained it. Yeah, Stargate explained a lot of things. Yeah. Um, for a given value of explained. How many episodes have I complained about the Watergate episode on? Only one. Okay. I right. have seen it. I know I know you don't like it. It's stupid. Like it's like it's called Watergate and it's literally a gate that goes through to water. Liz, it's a pun. How can you not like it? There's like a like I like a pun that's smart, but it's not really a really? pun. <laughs> she of ignorance fame. <laughs> Hey, He's coming at us his, about Watergate. His egg explains things to him. But that's, that's funny. That's my problem, though. So coming back to that bit where they put the device in the egg to blow it up. Yeah. So are you saying did the Joker Institute? They were protecting this secret, but they weren't aware of it. Yeah, they don't. They their motivation, as explained in the book, is they don't want anyone to find the Jokers because they think the Jokers are like gods, mm-hmm. and they're like they can't possibly be good. And nice, like they will wipe us out. Like we're afraid of them, and we don't want anyone to find them because that will surely lead to disaster. So they have no awareness of it. So they're not like, okay, there's one right here. Let's put a bombish no, thing in they it. They don't right. know that. Okay, they, it's just a backup plan to kill Dom um, by giving him the egg back because they thought maybe that's how we can get around his luck by blowing up his egg. But like eggs are lucky. Attacking. Yeah, but I think their their feeling was that it wasn't a direct attack on him, so it might work. I don't know. Hmm. It's a dominable. Uh. Well, he's indomitable, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dom and Dommer. Oh. Hmm. No, that's, 
why? Um, I'm it, sorry, anyway. I love that we peaked with Dom and Sob and we've just, <laughs> just kept mining it. Like maybe there's another one here and there just isn't. No. That's the best one. No. Uh, but this is the first the thing Indians. I thought. Uh... <laughs> no. No. For those listening at home, her head is in her hands. Yeah. That's great. yeah. Just like the sun pups. Yeah, but yeah. there's no, you know, there's no crackdown happening, so we're okay. Mm. Uh, that was a cool name for it, I thought as well. But look, we kind of gone through the whole plot of the book, so yeah. it's it, we've got to think. We, I mean, we've already talked a lot about what we thought about it, mm. and I know that you both felt very dissatisfied. Can we talk about the ending though? Because it does, it is very abrupt, and we've said this about some of his mm. early Discworld books mm. as well that the ending does feel quite abrupt. Kind of comes out of nowhere. I I actually found, even though I. I, I didn't think it was super satisfying. I thought it made sense. And I thought the things that he had laid mm. down, the clues that he gets from the bank and from Chattagasta, the, the living lake, and from the creeps, I, I thought that they did lay a path to this conclusion and it made sense. But it did sort of happen quite abruptly. And Dom's awareness of it is very subtle. Like I think it's too, like you don't sort of, get to see him figuring it out it just sort of happens but then again everything in this book one is really abrupt and two mm. dom's reaction is always really subtle so i think it's just in keeping with the way the entire book is written yeah i feel like this is a book of interesting ideas and some really strong scenes and i think i would have really liked to see him rewrite it later yeah because i think it could have been good not that it's terrible or anything, but I think with some of them paired back and some more experience, it could have been a much stronger book because it basically to me is like a loosely tethered together series of ideas and themes and interesting scenes and some less interesting scenes. But they have value in their individual components. I just didn't really rate them as a book. Yeah. If that makes sense. And there's things that I would cut aggressively out what would you cut out um about 50 percent of the names and the confusing human breakdown i think i didn't think we needed as much of it it's just because i struggled to keep it all in my head um and i I guess i don't like feeling dumb if that makes sense Mm -hmm. and such a short book so many characters that i don't think there was a payoff for i just yeah i i'm not sure what my fix would be to make it longer but I think it's just the way the information is given to us. Like there's a lot of information about the sun pups, but we sort of get that organically in a scene. We don't get a lot of the creepiness mm, yeah. eh, um, in a scene so much as we're sort of shown them. There's a, there's a short sort of back and forth and then just a clump of information about them. But if you asked me to recall a scene where we meet the first creep or things like that, I can't really recall it. But if you ask me about the sun dogs, I can sort of give you the beat by beat of each of those scenes. So, hmm. yeah, for me, it's it's just finding a better way to tell the story. And it feels like the first, like I'd cut out the first 20 or 30 pages even, like going back and really thinking about it what was really necessary there before the first assassination attempt. So he'd like started almost with him waking up as the new Goo Goo version of himself. Mm. Oh, I'd, I'd start with the assassination attempt. Okay. So that would be yeah. it for me. It would be a strong start. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it does start with an assassination attempt, but it's it's a, like a less yeah. exciting one before that. As a confusing one a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Just, yeah, I don't know. Okay. That's cool. I think, yeah, I, I, I feel like there's, I, I love how many ideas there are in this book, but there's not enough space in the book for all those ideas to to breathe. Mm. Like there's 52 races. The name, he doesn't mention the name of all of them, but he mentions that there's like 52 intelligent races in the universe and plenty of books will mention that. Yeah. But then he mentions the name of at least like, I think it's about a dozen mm. or more, maybe like more than a dozen. Uh, and we meet members of about six of them and we only really learn significant details about three of them really. Yeah. Um, or maybe four, and and that's cool, but it also is a lot of stuff that he wants to put on that table and be in that universe. And you either need to sort of just leave some more of it in the background, or have more room to do something mm. with it a bit more. I feel so. It's it's a tricky one. You know, what I want from this book mm. maps. Oh, maps. Yeah, I'd like some maps of the bubble. Just like I'd like a sort of a galactic, like to show the sort of 
yeah. planetary layout and then maybe one of Widdershins as well to show the layout of it Let's a little bit. So like. I think I would have enjoyed some maps. Hmm. But yeah. I don't know if that would have fixed things. I think I just would have liked it. Been nice. So for me, it sort of feels like with the Discworld, it felt like Pratchett was discovering it as he wrote each different book. We saw him yeah. just slap something else on and things evolved like Ankhmore Pork and things like that as he wrote the series. This feels like he has the universe and it's formed in his head, but he's telling us too much about the universe for the story that he has to tell. Yeah, It's mm. like sort of Tolkien taking the appendices and slamming them into the prose of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, mm. yeah, I see what you mean. And it's, it's like, yeah, it's like some of those fantasy books where they draw the map first and put it mm. in the front of the book. And sometimes that's useful, but if you've drawn the map before you've written any of your story, then you kind of making yourself obliged to put all the details on the map in the book, whether or not they serve that plot. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just quickly d- digress to a good life hack when reading fantasy books with a map, photocopy it, and then you can refer to it while you're reading the book without having to flip back to the front of the book. That is genius. And you can also map out the journeys on there as well. As, as the author sitting at the table, don't photocopy it. Just buy another copy of the book. Buy several. Have it. Yeah. Oh, I love you. One to look at and one to annotate. Nice. Well, you, yeah. know, you need at least three because you need one so you can look at the illustration on the cover while uh-huh. you're reading it. You yeah. need another one so you can be looking at the map and the inside yeah. of the cover Unless while you're Kirby it. drew it because in that case it's not going to help you with comprehending <laughs> it. Oh, I, I kind of like... Well, look, I mean, I would love to see some other... We, we've caught, made a call out for illustrations on the podcast before. Mm-hmm. And we've never been sent any. <laughs> I'm hoping that this might happen. If anybody knows of any fan art of any of the characters or races from this book particularly. I would love to Wouldn't see Wouldn't you have them. to be a fan of it to then draw the art? I'm sure there's, there's someone said it's their favourite. I'm a fan of it. I'm a fan of it. Okay, draw me a bank. I, okay. Well, <laughs> it's basically I a big don't circle. Think, I don't think the information <laughs> is there to create it. No, but I th- that doesn't mean you can't draw it. There's a gist. There's, the there's, feeling several, of it. there's several descriptions of Phenobes and how they have weird flappy skin and big, big eyes and, and stuff. And I mean, and, and the, there's a phenob on the front cover of my book, and I'm pretty sure that's that's who it is. Are they phenobes because like people are phobic towards them, and there's a whole like race stuff that's going on? Sorry, they do talk about <laughs> shape hatred, yeah, yeah, which is like you know fantasy racism. Not to be confused with fantasy football. It doesn't involve forming an imaginary mob of all your favourite racists. Although, if you do have any favourite racists. We recommend you read all of Pratchett's work again and take a good, hard look at yourself. Shape hatred was an interesting term for it. Um, yeah. Look, I think maybe now is a good time to talk about the things we liked about the book. Oh, I liked a lot of things. Oh, I let's think, talk I think about we've those. been pretty fair. I think we've mentioned that we liked some things, or has my like cynicism just seeped in? No, no. Just... I, you mentioned that you liked some things, and we've yeah. talked about a couple of them, but I, I want to find the specific things that we liked, like the favorite bits. Yeah. Because I, I, I mean, I, look, you can't see this, but I've got a lot of tags in my copy of the book. Oh, yeah, I've got some. I'm going to stop drawing the bank. Um, there is, I mean, just, one of the oh, things we do need to mention is how many Discworld terms get oh. dropped in this book. And yes. as, as one Hogwarts of our um, that confused the living hell out of me when I found out. I'm like, wait, is this the same universe? Well, like- you know, Sarah Pearson, who was a previous guest on the podcast, oh. who appeared on um, ABC's The Hard Quiz, uh, with her special subject being the novels of Terry Pratchett, uh, was asked, in which book does Hogswatch first appear? Oh. And she guessed one of the early Discworld novels, which is a very reasonable guess. And it was wrong because it first appears in The Dark Side of the Sun. That quiz is hard. Yeah, like they live up to their name, those jerks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, on page... Um, oh, I'd have to find the page. But there's one page where is mentioned... I think it might be page 67 in your edition, Liz. Because okay. um, that's what one of, our, one of our listeners mentioned that. Sven, thank you for mentioning that. Um, is it Eve of Small Gods? Yeah, it drops like mm. so many things at once. And the clutch, but not the clutch that we know. No, it's very different. And yeah, they're mostly. Me. Yeah. Well, because also it refers to, is it Soul Cake Friday? Uh, yes, yeah, Soul Cake Friday. Which in the Discworld becomes Soul Cake Tuesday. Hmm. It's, uh, if hmm. I remember rightly, it's it's not the same day or possibly Wednesday, but it's it's not Friday. And so many pre- precursors like the Assassin's Guild kind of, you can see the ideas bubbling mm. away there with ways yeah, as and well. Yeah, he works for United Spies or us. I thought Joker's was like kind of a, like, I don't know, there's like some pyramid vibes there as well, like the book Pyramid-C. 
Cards, cards. Got to sort of shout out with Billion to One as we talked about. Yeah, um, I, I thought there was some really. Uh, this uh, there is, are some really early indications of very Pratchetty wit in mm. this. Um, even when even just some of the the things that are not necessarily super funny, but they're they're quite witty. Like um, during the fir- very first assassination attempt, Dom's like diving away from being shot at, and he doesn't look behind him. And it said he stifled the urge to look around. Corridor had schooled him unmercifully in assassination drill. Knowing who was the assassin was small reward for being assassinated. <laughs> Corridor said, the price of curiosity is a terminal experience. Yeah, I loved that. I thought that was great. And that was very early on. So I enjoyed that a lot. For me, my big belly laugh was back to my MVP. Three's left eyeball twitched. Isaac had picked up a spanner. I perceived a possibility of an immediate chronological sequence of events which includes a violence, said three. He stepped back. I expressed preference for a chronological sequence of events which precludes a violence. <laughs> <laughs> it was just beautiful. Like that whole sequence, I was wetting myself laughing. It's pretty good. Um, oh, the joke where where he's, go- he's coming into the house and he's being questioned when he's returning... And they say, Halt, who goes there? Enemy or friend of Earth? Oh, yes. And he says, Foe, of course, <laughs> which is short for friend of Earth. I thought that was great. I loved this one where they're talking to the oh, bank. You get that. Oh, yeah. Friend or foe? Oh, oh, foe par by you. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, so to me, it sounds like jargon. Jargon? <laughs> I can't say the name. Turn to the bank. Yeah. Nonsense, he explained. In Saddamus tradition, God invented it to forestall the first attempt at interstellar travel to prevent scientists from understanding each other, you understand. Because like, jar- that is what jargon is for, is to preclude other people from understanding things. Isn't there that theory that like a lot of, uh, and this sort of applies more to political and, and, and uh, sort of arts theory jargon, was invented in, in Germany because in order to be allowed to continue publishing what was essentially anti-government stuff, um, the the philosophers and and um, uh, social commenters were allowed to write it as long as like the common people couldn't understand it. I don't know if that's true, but it's something that someone told me when I was in university, and it's always like made sense to me at how impenetrable standard academic prose is. Yeah, like in medicine, there's like a big push to simplify all the things because like it's just your body is just a whole bunch of dudes named bits of it after themselves. Yeah, and instead they want to name it sort of. Words that Makes mean sense. something so that they make sense. Chuby bit. Ch- Chuby bit with bile. <laughs> bit that, that filters the chuby bit. That was my nickname in high school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Um, other bits that I like. Do you know, um, sorry. No, go on. A person called Nicholas's nickname is Nick. <laughs> what? <laughs> like if your name is Nicholas, your nickname is Nick. Oh, yeah. right. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, is that, used is to, that where nickname comes from? No, yeah. no, it isn't. It used to. This was covered on a recent episode of The Illusionist. Because they nick like a part of your name off. No, it used to be a different word. It used to be Nick, uh, which was which went small, if I remember rightly. And mm-hmm. it's just that the sound changed, it became nickname instead of Nick name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, we're all richer for having listened to hour two of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Look. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, I also really like Isaac's first scene where he's introduced to Dom by Dom's sister and Dom, they're just talking about him like he's not there. And then Dom says, I wonder what makes us build inefficiently shaped human robots instead of nice streamlined machines. Pride, sir, said the robot. Hey, that's not bad. <laughs> he, says, he just gets super casual. I never quite, did we get a good read on Dom's personality? What's Dom like? I don't know what he's like he just felt like a conduit through which the plot happened to me but who seems stressed about becoming the chairman that's the main thing that i got the big thing is we could say oh yeah that's pratchett you know just being a bad writer but in terms of the plot that services it really well because it's about fate being what pushes someone it's not someone with their own motivations doing the pushing if that makes sense yeah, so he's just like... So he is the e- literal every man. He's a blank canvas that fate, or in this case probability math, has sort of pushed in this direction. That makes sense to me. Well, but I, I prefer that. I think... I, I, I'll, look, I'll give Sir Terry the benefit of the doubt and say that's what he was doing. Yeah, and, and it also it fits into that idea that he's had his his future predicted ever since he was a kid. So he's never yeah. been able to... But he wasn't aware of it, was he? He wasn't, but, but he's trapped by fate, you know. 
Yeah, they do. They do. Oh, yeah, they do. I loved. I did like that, that that joke at mm. the beginning where they're just like, "Oh, you couldn't have. You shouldn't have done that." Oh well. Yeah. <laughs> like I enjoyed that. Yeah, that was mm. good. That was good. Um, any other bits that people want to read out that they particularly enjoyed? I just want to mention that I enjoyed the legend of the prodigal son, but son spelled S U N. Like that was pretty pretty funny. <laughs> that was yeah. that was pretty good. Yeah, mm. I did. I liked that as well. Mm. But there's lots of little good throwaway lines. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Uh, there's so many, in fact. Um, there's, this is another bit that I, I printed out and stuck somewhere as a quote, actually, from this book, was one of the, the funeral song from Phnobis, which is it, it, just quoted at one point, and you're like, why Why is that? Oh, well, it's because it's um, when he's, like, coming back from the dead. It's sort of thematic rather than explanatory. But I just kind of liked it. And there's also like it, the first line of the second verse is, I must scream yet I have no mouth, which is a reference to a, f- a famous sci-fi story. And there's also like that bit, um, and I'm not sure if it's connected, but when he's thinking back into getting a body when he's got, after he's properly died-ish the first time, mm. he has to create a mouth for himself and they're like, there's something you want to do. And then he just starts screaming. So it, yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is I said this came out before Star Wars. It's also important to remember this came out before The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Huh. Uh, like before it was a radio series um, by a couple of years. And when you read it, like the the fact that there's all this stuff about probability, um, the sort of weird giant planet that seems sort of artificial, there's a lot of thematically similar things in here, even though the plot itself doesn't really, you know, fit. Um, I just I thought that was really interesting because I, I one thing I always used to say when I was younger uh, was in an infinite universe all things are possible which I I think I picked up directly from this book it appears right there I was like oh I just realized that's where I got that from it's like time is a flat circle yeah yeah it's kind of my version of that <laughs> I suppose and while we're reading stuff that we enjoyed I really enjoyed this part near the end uh, I'll just ask again why me said Dom you live at the right time. You are naturally cosmopolitan. You come from Widdershins. That was our world once, long ago, of course. You are rich. There is a certain amount of glamour attached to your position. Let's say it was fate. And I remember pulling back from that and I'm like, oh, that was that was quite nice. And it wasn't a joke. Like, Yeah. It's like there's nothing particularly special about you except you, you're you the right person in the right place at the yeah. right time. Like quite literally. Like, you, yeah. Yeah, which I, I enjoyed that too. Hmm. Um, Why yeah. is it math, not maths? Uh, Do we have American editions of the book? Because I had American spelling in mine. Yeah, was, mine's mine's not like, an American edition. Do you have math or maths? Um, I think mine's. What does it say? Let me find it. Uh, I think mine's might say P math. Because I there's, yeah, yeah yeah, but that's okay. Like I think. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's they're kind of interchangeable. Like in Australia, we're a bit more always maths, and in America, they're a bit more always math. But I think in the UK, it's a bit more of a case of one or the other is fine. But the best shade I've ever heard thrown at the like the distinction between the two was from Paul Bettany in the Night Tale director's cut voiceover. So hello to all both of the other people who've listened to that. Um, <laughs> you can pick up some gold in those commentaries. Because I think the, the director, who I've forgotten the name of, says something about math, and then Paul Bettany goes, yes, well, in England we call it maths because we tend to do more than one sum in a class. <laughs> oh, sick burn, dude, sick burn. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, yeah, there's a bit, sorry, it's just uh, as I was flicking through while you were saying that, um, I found another Hitchhiker's Guide-esque bit where one of the creeps hands Dom a towel. It says, it was rough and smelled of lemons. <laughs> I'm like, that sounds like something Douglas Adams would write. I don't know. But it also sounds filthy. <laughs> like what? the creep hands Dom a towel and it was rough and smells of lemons. <laughs> like it's just... What has happened to you, <laughs> Liz? Uh, so it's been will a long I blame day. You? I blame you, Will. <laughs> Look, it's my influence. It has been a long day. It yes, been a long day. it's been a long day. The, the, you wanted to read out some of the names... I wanted to read out specifically quack duck quack cuck quack quack a kek cack. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. It's one of the the Drosk homeworld names, isn't it? Yeah, and f- it says like the Drosk world of the thing I just said. Visiting humans picked uneasily at the horribly familiar food, which is kind of like how ducks eat. Like oh uh, yeah, yeah, like pecking. 
And they're traditionally uh, cannibals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I also enjoyed um, the whole cool heads thing, which I think is too complicated to go into. But I was like, is it antidepressants? Oh, like when they take the drugs that makes them... Have no feelings. Have no feelings and get smarter. It was weird. It was like a strange sort of throwaway thing that, again, I don't think... Well, again, I mean, it didn't come back. Yeah. Well, again, it was hinted I've, at a bit. Like, I was like, like something's going to happen, but yeah. Well, I feel like it was kind of a reference to Mentats in, in June. I haven't read June. Oh, well, the, in June, uh, the, the sort of backstory of the universe is partly that they had intelligent machines and they nearly killed everybody, so they outlawed them. So as a replacement, they train specially gifted humans to be human computers and they do become a bit less emotional and more analytical. So it's like the Matrix backwards mixed with hidden figures. Yes. Yes? Yes. There's more gods in it. Well, there's, a, there's not more gods in it. That's not true. Um, there's, there's more giant worms in it <laughs> than, than, in the, than in that. Um, oh, there's going to be a movie soon. Any day now, there'll be a movie of well, June. There, there, well, there already, there already is a movie of June. Yeah, um, it's not the rescue one. Yeah. Oh, I also liked um, when they're talking about where Stroker's world might be, they just casually go, how about rats? Well, we know what things are like on its planet and the reverse entropy situation might fit the dark side of the sun saying, and then someone says, the creep eyes say any creatures on Tenalp can't possibly be intelligent. And that's like star and planet backwards because it has reverse uh, entropy. I thought that was just cute. Hmm. I never go into it any- anywhere, but I just thought it was a cute thing to do. But look, there's, there's, those are all the things. We should probably ask and answer some questions, Liz. This one's from Melissa via our Discord, who said, The ending left me a little flat. What were the reactions of the characters to the reveal of the Jokers, and how did their interactions with each other change after? What about the Joker Institute? How do they cope with the reveal? How do they continue into the future? So many questions. So basically, what happened next? Yeah. It is one of those stories that in some ways ends at the point where you're like, isn't this the most interesting thing to happen? Don't we want to know how people cope with this rather than just stop here? But I, you know, this kind of story often ends like that. I mean, 2001 ends with them going, oh, look, here's all the, here's a new son and the aliens have been nice to us. And now I'm a space baby if you're watching the film version. And it makes much less sense than this book, frankly. Um, I nearly need to watch that again. I watched it when I was way too young and or read the book. But, you know, it ends in a similar kind of place, I feel. But is it satisfying? Do we want to know what happens next? I don't. <laughs> I like those lingering questions. I like being able to sort of sit with an idea, you know, because there were lots of ideas here. I think he armoured us with all the ideas we'd sort of need to then extrapolate, okay, what happens next in our version, in our heads. And sometimes that's the most exciting thing about reading a book is the future is yours to sort of fill in. Hmm. Hmm. I'd like a bit more of the, the smart water. But I think that it's not really yeah. another ending that I'd want. I do like that the last thing that happens in the book is that Dom fulfills his promise to Chattagusta and takes the bit of him from the lake mm. on band and pours him into the ocean on Widdershins so that he can spread and become bigger. I thought that was really nice that that was his last thing that he does. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Sven Uckerman by Twitter. So... What is, in your opinion, the worst Pratchett so far? And which author in your eyes kept the same quality level throughout his or her career? Oh, that's a tricky one. Well, I feel like I know what you're, you two are going to answer. <laughs> um, do you think it's this one? Is this the worst Pratchett that you've read? My worst one used to be The Colour of Magic, but I think this one has just taken over. Mm-hmm. Liz? Yeah, of the ones I've read, this one, I think it's just because it, he's not there yet. Like he, but you can see what he's going to become. In it, but yeah. It's fascinating. The closest I've ever had to this experience was when I read Ghost Head a Watchman and I was like, oh, there's something here, but it's not To Kill a Mockingbird yet. And it was just, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I probably agree. I, I, I think we've established I probably like this a lot more than either of you did, but um, not that that makes me a better person. Well, you read it twice. Maybe I have it read it twice. It opens itself up to someone on second reading. Um, I probably read it, read it more than twice, actually. I think given how some of the things when I was mm. reading this time around really struck me as familiar, although I didn't remember, I, I kind of remembered how it ended when I started reading it. So I think I must have read it more than once because otherwise I wouldn't have remembered how it happened like 22 years later. But um, yeah, I, uh, I I think it it is. It is probably the, the weakest Pratchett that I've that I've read. Um, I think Strata is a, is a stronger book. 
Um, and I think even the, the Carpet People I really like, but I've only read the sort of second version of The Carpet People where he did a rewrite on it when he was much older. So um, I don't know what I would think of the original one which he wrote when he was still a teenager. I'd love to read it though. Yeah, I think it would be fascinating. I wonder if anybody, if anyone knows where we could get a copy, that would be incredible. Um, we've got a question from Red Artifice by Twitter. The opening sequence has actually really vividly stuck with me from this one. Also a question. If your godfather was a sentient planet bank, what birthday present would you hope for? Now, I did like the opening sequence because it's got that weird sort of alien world and the weird things coming up out of the deep and the guy trying to surf on it. But I kind of agree that it doesn't really... It, it doesn't... It's a shellfish quite... way to start. <laughs> What? <laughs> you look so pleased with yourself, Liz. I'm glad you recovered nice joke. from before. Oh. <laughs> yes, you're very sharp. Well done. Yes. Oh. Um, oh. Anyway, uh, see how it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh God! There are no appropriate tentacle puns, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but no, I, I I liked it. I think it does kind of pay off later because there's the whole thing where he gets regrown. It, it sets up the what the rest of the population on Widdishins is like. And so when he gets obliterated and regrown from Gugu and he's green and he decides to stay green and you've got those sailors sort of, uh, you know, the other locals like winking at him going, yeah, you're all right, you're one of us because lo- loads of them have lost arms to the sharp mm. shells and they've had them grown back from the Gugu. You're like, oh, yeah, that's nice. That's, a, that's a, I think, was an effective bit of world building. Mm. Um, not all of it worked maybe, but yeah. Anyway, and the, the second half of that question this was... What birthday present would you want from your sentient planet bank godfather? Oh. I want the flying shoes. Yeah, that's... They are pretty good. It's hard to go past them, really. Yeah. Wouldn't you like flying shoes? Yeah. Yeah. They seem like they're pretty good flying shoes as well, because like, your center of balance, I always worried with flying shoes would be mm. really off. But Well, I mean, I'm I'm not a you know galactic chairman of a whole planet, so I can't afford my own spaceship that flies to other planets. Would you tell us if you were? Yes. I would, um, but I, uh, but I, so I would hope he would give me a spaceship. I'd want the smart ass copper horse. <laughs> I quite enjoyed him. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's like you've ridden a horse before, boss. It's like no. completely redundant and unnecessary. But I was like, but, yeah. maybe yeah. a precursor to the camels, like the smart camels. Yeah, yeah, like in, yeah. Oh, so, it, are the swamp eggs a precursor to swamp dragons? Could be a little bit, maybe. Um, so this one's from Sven Ockerman again. Um, how much of later books do you find in this? I have so far a small god, Clatch, Soul Cake Alone on page 67. Is this book the proto-pratchet containing the seeds for all later books? Hog's Watch also. So I think we've covered this a little bit across it. Like, yeah. 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 Is, like if you planted it in the ground, a whole bunch of Discworld would grow out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Strata too. Like if you haven't read Strata, it's largely about them discovering a flat planet yeah. and going, how is this possible? But it's like... When you're writing, and it's my process anyway, I write something and then I leave it and come back to it a year later and something else has sprouted in my mind. So I think this is kind of the process where he's written all this stuff, put it down and then sort of revisited these ideas because his subconscious has been working on him, working on it. And that's how he ended up with something as rich as the Discworld. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting that these two early versions, like this in Strata, actually got published mm. as well. And in the same way, the Carpet People definitely has sort of some of the makings of the Gnomes books. Yeah. So, question from Melissa from Discord. Given enough time, do you think Hex from Unseen University would evolve to be like First Syrian Bank? <laughs> He'd have to get a lot bigger. <laughs> Where would he go? He'd fill the whole like high energy magic building. Yeah. I don't think there's anywhere on... I mean, there isn't anywhere in Ankh-Morpork Pork that could accommodate an entire planet. He could go under the crust. Like, is he, oh, you want, is like he, in the Ankh? Well, he, like he, in the river? <laughs> I meant like under the crust yeah. of the earth <laughs> because he's like, he relies on ants going through little tunnels, right? So they could just make lots of tunnels under the earth. Final question from Melissa. Why was human status chosen as the marker of being or is that only because we're experiencing the story from a human perspective? Would it be different if we had the story told from the point of view of the Fnobes, Creep Eye, or even the first Syrian bank? I would read a book from the bank's perspective yeah i like the bank the bank was cool but i really like that question yeah, that it's a good question nice. yeah but, well i because for me i i feel like that that early bit where they talk about the humanity act is saying well the definition in this book of human is broader than what you're used to thinking of for starters it encompasses all these different offshoots of earth humans on different planets who've evolved in different ways because there's like the planet Third Eye where they're a bit psychic and there's Wittishins where they're all resistant to UV and there's, you know, the other 
planet where they, I can't even remember what the other ones were, but there's a couple other ones mentioned in passing. And then also they say that Fnobes are classed as human and uh, class five robots are classed as human. And the Creepi are actually classed as superhuman mm. because they're the oldest race and they're much, much smarter. And they're, they've, they're the ones who invented the matrix drive, which allows interstellar travel. And they gave it to the other races so that they could all talk to each other and hang out. Um, so I, I thought it actually did it, try and expand that, but then kind of shot itself in the foot a bit by only having really, you know, the two non-human protagonists as real sidekicks. Mm. Cause like Isaac does steal a lot of scenes, but he and Hershigan are really not that important to the plot. They're very much secondary characters and the main character is a human. If it, was, human. if it was from Fnob's perspective, it would be like 40% S's. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it'd just be like, yeah, there'd be a lot more mushrooms in it as well. I really like the Fnobs. Yeah, they're good. I thought they were cool. I liked all the aliens in this. I really like it when the aliens are not just people with sort of slightly weird heads mm. and arms. And and I felt like all the alien races that we meet in this, they have their own culture, they have their own look, they have their own differences, and a lot of effort went into that. And maybe the effort of thinking about that is why he wanted to make sure it was on the page because he's gone to that trouble to like sort of think about what's this alien look like and what is it like and what is its society like because the idea of having these multiple viewpoints is so important to the plot by the end yeah hmm. some good questions yeah some great questions um if you've got anything else you want to tell us about the dark side of the sun we'd love to hear from you you can hit us up using the hashtag pratchat 18 on social media so that we see your questions um but that pretty much brings us to the end of the episode will thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for having me can you tell tell us about what books have you got out at the moment that we should all be buying these multiple copies of so i usually write contemporary ya but i have my first fantasy ya coming out in september it's called monuments it's about a group of teenagers who almost go on a legend of zelda style quest but instead of raiding dungeons and temples they're raiding sort of sanctuaries hidden under high schools in Sydney. Oh, okay. I'm in. I want yeah. to read that. That sounds awesome. Okay. September is so far away. Uh, but if you're listening to this <laughs> after September 2019, get to a bookstore, get yourself a copy of Monuments by Wilkes Starkus. It sounds awesome and I'm really keen to read it. It has a pretty rad cover too. Now, don't forget also that Liz and myself will both be at Nullis Anxiety 7, the Australian Discworld Convention on April the 13th and 14th including our recording of a special live bonus episode of Pratt Chat, which we can now tell you we will be discussing the short story Troll Bridge with special guest Tansy Rayner Roberts, who will be in town from Tasmania, uh, which is going to be very exciting. We're looking forward to that. There is a little bit of exciting Splendid Chats Productions news that I have been dying to share with you, and finally I am allowed to. You might be aware that we made an audio drama, a time travel comedy called Night Terrace, which is kind of a bit like an Australian version of Doctor Who if the Doctor was a cranky older woman who didn't really want to go on adventures. Uh, that show has been picked up by the BBC and is going to be broadcast on BBC Radio 4 Extra in April this year uh, with Series 2 following in August. You can find out all the details about that at nightterrace.com. And we're very excited to be able to share that with a wider audience and we hope that you listen in. Um, and in our next episode, Liz, what are we going to be reading? We're going to be reading soul music. Yes. Oh, I've been looking forward to this one. It's one of my favorites. We're hoping that you'll join us for that as well. If you want to send us any questions, as always, get them to us via social media using the hashtag for the next episode, which is Pratchat19. And until then, hopefully, PMath will work out in your favor. <laughs> You've been listening to Pratchett, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast with Pratchatters Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Will Kostakis. Pratchett is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pratchett Podcast and listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via pratchettpodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchett18. Pratt Chat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Star Trek podcast Rediscovery and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.